is an honor to be here. We have had an incredible weekend for Natasha and I. Um, any chance to be with Pastor Andy and Pastor Lisa, we're among friends, but then to have Pastor Nate here, who's one of our best friends, Pastor Mike and Nancy Miller. We just love what God is doing through Coastline, but in the church across the country. And um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives this instruction. He says, I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. That's great advice from the Apostle Paul, who's actually so confident in his relationship with Christ that he says, if you want to know what it's like to be close to Jesus, follow me. Your pastors would probably not say this of themselves, but I'll say it for them. Follow them as they follow Christ. You have incredible leaders in this house. Follow them as they follow Christ. Follow them in how they lead their family. Follow them in how they have faith for you and for the city and the region. Follow them in their integrity. Follow them in their character. Follow them as they follow Christ. I love the fact that Natasha and I get to follow you in friendship, have relationship with you. You're such an encouragement and a blessing. And listen, if they hadn't followed God, you wouldn't be here. And so can we just show some appreciation for Pastor Andy and Pastor Lisa, world-class, two of the best. And since I've, since I've got you up, let's read Mark chapter 6, verse 41 together. I'll try to keep my voice slow taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up into heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is powerful and effective. These aren't my words, they're your words. We ask today that they would not return void, but they'd penetrate the heart, bring change and transformation. In Jesus' name, amen. Grab your seat, grab your seat. I, uh, I've introduced this story today from the Gospel of Mark, and we'll call that his angle, but I want to cut up the story of the, of the feeding of the 5,000, almost like it's a feature film. It is the only story in the Gospels outside of the resurrection of Christ that shows up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which tells us something about the weight and the significance of this particular moment in time. The four Gospels give four unique camera angles on the life and times of Jesus Christ. And so Mark is a cut to the chase kind of guy. He doesn't waste his time on details. He doesn't give you a lot of the fluff. Mark doesn't even talk about baby Jesus. He has no time for that. He just wanted to get to the goods. Um, so Mark's gospel is sort of the storyboard, the big picture. But then in Matthew, Luke, and John, you get the details. You get these nice cuts. You get the background information. I chose this story today knowing that it would be familiar to many Many of you have heard the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It is a famous miracle of Christ. Uh, but I chose it because it is a situation where the need in front of the disciples is greater than the resource they have on hand. They're, they're facing a need that they can't possibly meet. And I think that's timely today because I know the vision in the heart of your pastors for your church, and I know that the vision in the future that is in front of Coastline is greater than the resources you have on hand. I know that the vision to reach the island, I know that that even the vision for Victoria, there are 400,000-ish people in this region. You do not have 400,000 seats in this building or in West Shore. The vision that's in front of you is greater than the resource you have on hand. And personally today... I know that you, because you're a human like me, walked into the room with a need that you can't meet. You walked into the room with something that maybe you've tried and you've, you've prayed and you've sought counsel and you're doing everything you know how to do, but there's just that thing, that something, that issue, that moment, that miracle that's in the waiting that you haven't seen yet. And unless God shows up, you have no idea what to do. There's a need in front of you that you can't meet in your own strength. And when you have a need that's greater than the resource, you are on miracle territory. So do not be discouraged. Where you are in that place of deficiency is actually miracle territory. So I want to get some context on this story. I want to look at some different camera angles. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 says, When Jesus heard what had happened... 
He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. I like that Jesus withdrew privately. Before Jesus could feed the 5,000, before Jesus could perform these miracles and be teaching, he's like, I need some alone time. I can identify with Jesus needing some alone time. I'm pretty sure Jesus was an omnivert. Okay, so you got your extroverts and your introverts. The extroverts, you're a little wild. You come in today, you're gonna linger in the atrium after the service. You just be like, where is there, I want more people to talk to. Who can I hang out with? I don't wanna rub, I don't wanna go home and be by myself. I wanna be around people, people. And you freak the rest of us out. And then there's the introverts. You're like, I hope nobody says hi to me. I hope I can sneak out. You're gonna try and make it out of your row as soon as the band starts playing at the very end of the surface. You don't want anyone to acknowledge that you're here. Pretend I don't exist. Jesus is somewhere in the middle. He likes the crowd. He interacts with the crowd. He's got patience for the crowd. But over and over in scripture, you see him retreat to a solitary place where he can just get alone. I understand the need to be alone, to refuel. I, I, would, I, I am an introvert. I recharge by myself. So I can handle environments like this, but it's a pretty short window of time that I've got. At our church, um, in the location that I preach at, there's three services. And so um, I have to roll into a Sunday morning with a very full social battery. We don't go out on Saturday nights at my house. We just sit at home and watch hockey and the social battery gets filled up. And then on Sunday, it's just getting depleted and sucked dry by all the people at Experience Church. And, it, and it's all good. We love the people. But, but, but I know that um, by the time I'm preaching the third service, we don't stream the third service because I say things that are inappropriate because my social battery is low. After the third service, when it's time to go and interact and sh uh, shake babies and kiss hands or, uh, you know, kiss babies and shake hands, uh, when it's time to go interact, I gotta have a handler with me who's making sure that I, I, I interact appropriately with people because the social tank, the battery's just a little bit low. And so I love to get alone. My favorite thing about Sunday is 2.30 p.m. I'm at home and I'm on the couch and I'm alone and I'm watching football and I might fall asleep till seven and I'll get up for 10 minutes, have a snack and then I'll lay on the couch again. It's beautiful and I recharge and it's necessary. Home is my favorite place to be. I love being at home. A lot of people don't understand it. Guys in the church would be like, hey pastor, you wanna go out for wings? Hey pastor, you wanna do like a guy's night? I can't think of anything worse. Hey, pastor, a few of us are booking a tea time. You want to go golf? I'm like, what is wrong with you guys? I have a wife and children. I can't golf and have a family. Are you insane? No, I want to be home. I like to be home. I like to be home with my people. But then there are moments when I'm home with my people. I'm like, God, why are there so many people here? <laughs> And so I have moments, and I'm sure you can appreciate it. If you can't, I'll just pretend you can, so I'm not the only one. But, but where even at home, I just need to get away. And so I've got this rhythm and this habit. Like when I come home, the first thing I do to come home is I got to recharge for a minute. So I will just go find a bathroom, and I'll lock myself in. I'm not, I'm not even doing anything most of the time. Most of the time, I'm just sitting on the floor watching sports highlights. Again, I watched them the night before, but I'm watching them again, and it recharges my battery. Because if I don't recharge my battery, I'm not going to respond well to my kids. when they're like, Dad, come and see the new world I built in Minecraft. I'm like, I don't care. Unless you're training to be an architect and take care of me when I'm old, I don't care. Dad, look at what happened in Monopoly Go. Dad, come listen to the story I wrote. Dad, look at the picture that I drew. All the things I just don't have the, I don't have the capacity for it unless I've recharged. And, and when they were little, they don't do this as much anymore because they're however old, 16, 14, 12, and 10. And so, so it doesn't happen quite as much. But then when they were little, I'd be in there just trying to have some time to myself. And their hands would come under the door. <laughs> You can see like the cutest, chubbiest little fingers. Like, Dad, Dad, we know you're in there, Dad. And it's this tension because I'm on. I, I love this person. God's blessed me with this child, and I love them. But I also want to take each finger and snap it back, <laughs> so they'll leave me alone and just give me a minute. I think that's what Jesus is feeling. He just needs a minute 
and the apostles roll up, and it's like Peter's got his hands under the bathroom door. Jesus, I just want to tell you about my day. He's like, I just need some time. So they went away by themselves, it says in Mark 6, verse 31, in a boat to a solitary place. Many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Um, so they, they try to get away. They arrive on the other side where they're anticipating some quiet time and there is a welcoming committee there to greet them. I love the posture of Jesus. Instead of being frustrated, instead of, of being annoyed, and instead of showing agitation, it says that Jesus had compassion on the people. He had compassion. Um, sometimes I think we, we maybe misunderstand exactly what compassion is. Do you know that compassion is not to have concern? Compassion's not sympathy. Compassion's not empathy. Compassion's not a post on social media. Compassion's not a text message that says, OMG, tough day, thoughts and prayers. Compassion is all of that combined with action. You are not compassionate because you feel something. You are compassionate because you're moved to act on behalf of another. In fact, the definition is that you do something to relieve the pain of another person. That is compassion. So when the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them, it wasn't just thoughts and prayers. It wasn't just but well wishes and feelings. He looks and sees 5,000, and, and, and most scholars believe that's 5,000 men, which represent households, probably upwards of 15 to 20,000 people total by the time you add wives and kids. Jesus looks out on the group and has compassion on all of them. Not a few not the ones who sat close, not a certain demographic, all of them. And to have compassion is to look and be like, I know they're in pain, everybody carries weight, everybody suffers, everybody has need. I know what they're going through and I'm motivated to act and do something about the issue. It is amazing to me that Jesus can know everything about everyone and still look with compassion. And if he can look at a crowd of 20,000 people and feel compassion, it means that he can look at the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds gathered in this room right now and have compassion on us. Man, mind-blowing. He knows every mistake we will ever make has compassion. He knows every impure motive and has compassion. He knows every thought, every intention, all of your history, all of your mess, and still has compassion. He understands that you carry weight. He understands that we navigate pain. And Jesus is motivated to move and act to alleviate the pain that we feel. Now, even more than the fact that Jesus had compassion over the 20,000 gathered on a hillside that day, even more than accepting that, wow, isn't that amazing? He has compassion on us. Please don't forget that the same way he looked at that crowd and the same way he looks at this crowd is the same way he looks at people who are walking down the street in Victoria right now. That's the same way he feels about the people in our city. That's the same way he feels about the people from coast to coast. He doesn't just have compassion on Christians. That's not Jesus. Jesus has compassion on every person, no matter what they've done, where they've been, how far they are, no matter how many times they've rejected him, his posture is, they're in pain and I can help. Now what gets me about this story is that it's not just Jesus having compassion, it's why Jesus had compassion. Jesus didn't have compassion because it was a big crowd. Jesus didn't have compassion because of their economic standing or situation. Jesus did not have compassion because they traveled a great distance. Jesus didn't have compassion because they were all hungry. It says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. Interesting, what moved Jesus was that he looked at a group of people and said, these people 
have no leader, I have to do something about it. Sheep without a shepherd, wandering, vulnerable, lost, no shepherd. What stirs up the compassionate response of Jesus towards you, towards me, towards the world around us is when he looks out and says, man, these people have no leader. That's what moves Jesus. That there's a, there's a leadership gap in the world. And I'm not just talking a federal leadership gap. This isn't political commentary. I'm not talking a provincial leadership gap, even though you guys can't decide who should be the premier. <laughs> I'm talking a personal leadership gap. Here's what makes it tricky. We don't like to be led. I, I don't like to be led. I have a feeling you don't like to be led. If we're being honest, we all want cheerleaders more than we want leaders. If we're being honest, we'd rather have pom-poms and backflips than somebody telling us what we're supposed to do with our lives. We all would rather be cheer-led than led. And we have, in Western culture, created this expectation and this aura around Christ that to have a relationship with Jesus is to have your own little personal cheer squad walking with you everywhere you go. That's kind of what we expect. So you've got this little cheer Jesus with his pom-poms and it's saying, hey, great job. Hey, you're amazing. Hey, I affirm that really dumb decision. Hey, you're the best. Hey, you're so great. Hey, keep doing that really toxic thing. I love you. Give me a, like, like Jesus is there in the morning when you wake up. Give me a J. J, you got your J, you got your J. Give me an O. Oh, you got your, I don't, I don't know what this is, but you get the idea. I'm not gonna spell my whole name, but that's the relationship we want with Jesus. But, but we need a Lord who leads not a cheerleader who just supports, loves, affirms, coddles, and celebrates. It's not bad to have some of that, but not at the expense of being led. Do not chase encouragement and affirmation at the expense of having real godly leadership. And Jesus says, the crisis that I see that motivates me to action is a world without leadership. They're like sheep without a shepherd. I don't know what you think when you think sheep and shepherds. I think woolly, I think cuddly, I think soft, I think warm, I think babbling book in the background, Bambi snacking on some grass over here. I think, oh, that's so peaceful. When I think Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. He's my shepherd. I've got all this stuff. But if you really understood the order of Psalm chapter 23, verse one, and what David is saying when he writes the Psalm, He's saying, hey, he's my shepherd first, so I lack nothing. We want the order to be reversed. We want God, I'll, I'll follow your leadership when I got money in my bank account. I'll follow your leadership when my business takes off. I'll follow your leadership when, when you answer that prayer request. I'll follow your leadership when it looks like you've come through for me. No, no, do not get the order flipped around. David's saying, hey, because he's my leader, I lack nothing. Not I lack nothing, and so I've made the decision he must be worth a follow. No, no, no. You gotta follow him first, and it's only when you follow him and say, God, I need you to be my shepherd, I need you to be my leader, that then you'll lack nothing. And the rest of Psalm 23 is just explaining what it looks like to have him be your leader. It says, hey, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil for he's with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And I, when I think Psalm 23, I think it's cross stitch hanging on the refrigerator. Can I just shake it up a little bit for you? It is a leadership text. It's not a coddle and comfort me text. What is he saying? When you're led, your leader's gonna make you do things that you don't naturally want to do. That's what it means to be led. 
I, I, I can't follow my emotions. I can't follow my best and brightest ideas. I need a leader, and the leader sets the vision. But then he says he guides me, which means he does, doesn't only want to set the vision for your life. He wants to take your hand and say, here's how we get from where you are today to where I've created you and called you to go. So he's going to make me do some things. He's going to lead me somewhere. He's going to guide me, and he's not going to guide you along the shortest route and the easiest route. You're not going to be flying first class into your future. He's going to take you to the valley of the shadow of death. Which means you got to be okay being led into the unknown. You got to be okay not being able to see around every corner. You got to trust your leader that even though it's dark and complicated and some of this hurts, I know that he's leading me to a place that's ultimately best for me where I'll find my rest and fulfill my purpose. That's what it means to have a leader. This rod and his staff, they'll comfort me. They're like, oh, I love to be comforted. Do you know what the rod is? It is the discipline of the Lord. He uses it to beat sheep when they're being stupid. It's like, yes, Lord. Sometimes I wander and I need to be smacked upside the head and I need to get my disciplines in order and live according to your word. The staff was held by a teacher, a position of authority. He wants to discipline and he wants to teach. Why? Because he has anointed you for purpose. He has anointed you for purpose. So listen, your leader's gonna lead you, make you, refresh you, guide you, discipline you, teach you. Why? Because you are called to something greater than what you're seeing right now. These people have no leader. And Jesus starts to preach. And he's, my son would say, he's cooking. That's what he says about their football team. When he has a good game, he's like, Dad, I was cooking. That I was, I was cooking. He's having a good game. Jesus is cooking. He's serving it up. He's preaching. He's got 30 points. They're all alliterated. He gets the band up. They do an altar call. He gets everyone to sit back down. They do it again. Modesty blankets are out. The whole thing. Jesus is just going, and he preaches all day. And at some point, I think the disciples are in the front row getting a little bit restless. Thomas is like, Oh, God, I've heard this one before. Uh, didn't he preach this last week? Yeah. Um, and then they start trying to get Jesus' attention. Psst. Psst. Jesse. Psst. Hey, Christ. Hey. You run. Wrap it up. I only know, listen, I only know these signs because I see them every Sunday. Okay. <laughs> I used to, early on, I thought, man, I can look at my wife for encouragement. Now I have to avoid eye contact the entire sermon. Because if I look down at the wrong time, she's giving me one of these. Say, hey, you're running a little long. One of these, say, hey, wrap it up. So I just got to look over her head into the second row. She's giving me this one. You're, you're done. It's over. Now, here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem, though. When you're cooking... And when it feels like things, man, I got it. We're just, it's happening today. When I see this, I'm like, man, she's telling me I got more time. Ignore the clock. You keep going. What's this? Keep preaching. Don't stop now. You're on a roll. You're killing them today. So I, I think Jesus maybe misread the signs. Because <laughs> they're giving, and then finally, they're like, somebody's got to interrupt him. I bet they drew straws. They rock, paper, scissors. I don't know. I think Peter probably fell to Peter because Jesus was always kind of frustrated with Peter anyways. Peter, he doesn't really like you. You go. <laughs> Finally, they get up their nerve. It says, by this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. Hey, um, this is kind of a remote place. And it's already really late. And I'll be honest with you, we're really hungry. And send the people away. They made it about the people. So it wasn't about them. It's about the people. Send them away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Now that's a wide shot from Mark. Let's just zoom in a little bit in John chapter six. It says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these? Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one 
to have a bite. Now, there is a problem in, in that the disciples are staring deficiency in the face. They do not have enough on hand to feed and meet the need of the people in front of them. They don't have enough food to meet the crowd. It's late. They're hungry. Uber Eats does not deliver out this far. They have no easy and obvious solution to feed 20,000 people. Listen, we have to be honest about the fact that we all also have an area of deficiency in our lives. I don't know everybody's story. I don't know your journey. I don't know what it took for you to get up this morning and show up to church, but I know that there are people who walked in here and you're deficient when it comes to peace and you're deficient when it comes to joy and you might feel deficient when it comes to resource and finance or deficient when it comes to strategy and clarity or deficient when it comes to time or you might not have enough hope. You might not, you might not have enough. You might have even walked in today just feeling like I'm gonna show up again, but I don't feel like I'm enough. Deficiency. Here's the best part. The Bible says Jesus already had in mind what to do. He already had in mind what to do. I love it. In the face of deficiency, Jesus knows exactly how he's going to come through. So as you walked in and maybe woke up deficient, Jesus looked and thought, man, I know exactly what I've got to do in their life to meet the need that they're facing. He already knew. God is never surprised by a situation. Jesus is never caught off guard by a diagnosis. He's not ever listening to your prayers thinking, man, I didn't know it was that bad. I hope somebody has an idea of how he can meet that need. No, he already knows exactly what to do. He knows, he knows exactly what this church needs for the future. Pastor Mike and Nancy, he already knows the building he's teeing up for you. He already knows exactly what's needed to meet the need. He already knows. He already knows. He asked the question, where will we buy bread? Not for his sake, but for the sake of the disciples. Why? Because your deficiency always reveals your dependency. He's illuminating in this moment that in the face of a great need, they have not been depending on him, but have been depending on their own natural resource. He's asking to, to expose, listen, you don't have enough to meet this need, and the place you keep looking is not enough to satisfy the void that you're feeling. And it's not until you realize that you don't have enough, it's not until you realize that you don't have what it takes in your own strength that you'll actually start looking to him. The other thing I notice is Jesus doesn't ask Philip, how will we buy food? Notice that? He says, where shall we buy food? Jesus is not asking Philip to pick up the tab. Jesus is looking for a restaurant recommendation. And Phil misreads the whole thing. Jesus is saying, hey, Phil, uh, where should we go for dinner? He had no concern who was gonna pay. Jesus is the one with the unlimited credit card anyways. He always planned to pick up the tab. He always knew he was the one who was gonna provide. He's just asking Philip to partner with him. And Philip's that guy at dinner who's like, oh shoot, Jesus, I forgot my wallet again. Jesus knows Phil's not gonna pay. But because of his dependency filter, he missed out on the opportunity to partner with Christ in a miracle. The question wasn't, how will you pay for this? Of course, Phil, I'm going to pay for this. I'm just giving you a chance to be involved. And your answer in the face of deficiency reveals where you're dependent. It's like, ah, oh, it would take more than half a year's wages. And Phil's calculating and he's trying to come up with a solution based on what's easy and tangible and obvious. Listen, most of the needs that you're gonna face will not be met by what's easy and obvious and external, but by a supernatural God who is beyond your scope and is moved with compassion to get involved in your situation. And so we have to stop focusing on what I need and what I don't have. When it's, when it's all about what you don't have, there's a need. Yeah, but God, I don't have enough and I don't have the experience. And I don't have the knowledge and we don't have enough money. And I never had the home life and I don't have the talent and I don't have a spouse yet. Which, by the way, why are you waiting for a spouse before you run after the call of God? Get after it now. They'll show up when it's time. God, I don't have the confidence. Listen, Jesus is not worried about what you don't have. He's like, man, if you would just be willing to go for it, I'd pay for it. Yeah. We gotta be willing to go for it. 
He's gonna pick up the tab anyways. Philip does not have enough, and a lot of the stress that we carry in life is because we're trying to be enough in our own strength. Then we're dealing with a world that's constantly saying, listen, you're enough. You're amazing. You're, ama you're, you're so incredible just as you are. Don't change a thing. You're wonderful. No, you're not. <laughs> Neither am I. We are not enough on our own. It is exhausting to try and be enough in your own strength for every situation you face. If you're tired and worn out and burnt out, it's likely because you have a dependency problem. But then there's Andrew, who in John chapter six, here comes Drew, Simon Peter's brother. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far would they go among so many? I just catch the difference. Philip's like, we don't have anything. Andrew's like, hey, we got something. It's like, Jesus, I, I found this. It's like, shut up, Phil. Jesus, I found this lunch. We got five loaves and two fish. And see, deficiency, if your heart's right, will lead to a discovery of what you do have. What do you have? Here's what we have, Jesus. It doesn't seem like much, but it's something. What if we just came to Jesus with that posture? It's not, it might not be enough, Jesus, but it's something. It's what I do have. It's, it's something, Jesus. I don't feel like I'm enough today, but, but here's, here's me. Jesus, this is all the faith I got. It's fractured. It's hurting. I'm grieving. I've got questions, but you can have the faith I do have. Jesus, I don't feel like I got a lot of confidence right now, but here's the confidence I do have. Jesus, things are tight. We don't feel like we got any money, but here's what I do have. Jesus, it's not much but it's what I've got. It's something. Listen, I don't know what you do have, but everybody's got something. It might be a little bit of oil. It might be five stones. It might be a kid's lunch, but you have something. And something plus the Savior is everything you need to unlock a miracle, is everything you need to step into the future. Just something plus Jesus. That is the equation. Something plus the Savior. Now, there's a miracle that I don't think gets talked about enough, and it's the miracle of the mom who made lunch. Shout out to the, the lunch-making moms in the room today. Listen, I, yeah, go ahead. Give yourselves a hand. Way to go, mom. I underestimated how much drama lunch was going to cause in our home. Our four kids going to school, you would think that maybe just the school system would create drama. Nope, it's lunchtime. They get home from school. Hey guys, how was your day? Fine. But you'd never believe what so-and-so had in their lunch today. They had Dunkaroos and I had fishy crackers again. I'm like, okay, well their teeth are falling out. Now, in fairness, we've had to keep a pretty tight rotation. You don't, just, you don't just have four kids and make them all custom lunches. So Mondays is ham wraps. Tuesdays are cheesy noodles. Wednesdays are hot dogs, which I'll be honest, kind of gross, and you wrap them up in the morning and wait till lunchtime. But then Thursdays are this beautiful combination. It's like a ham noodle hot dog wrap. We just kind of take everything we got left over. and some. So, so listen, they don't have the best lunches, but they're getting fed. <laughs> Shout out to the mom who got up and did what she did every day. I guarantee you she was not thanked for making lunch that day, but she got up and said, I'm gonna pack a lunch for my kid because it's what I do. And she got up and this small moment of regular everyday faithfulness in the mundane thing is something that happened likely in the dark of the morning. It was quiet, it was secret, it was private. But if mom didn't get up and live faithfully and consistent, if mom didn't get up and pack a lunch for her kid for the 10 hundredth time, or thousandth time, if she didn't get up and pack a lunch again, the miracle never happens. And your faithfulness is the miracle before the miracle. Do not take the supernatural out of what it means to be faithful into the call of God. She did what nobody saw. She did what nobody high-fived her for. She did what nobody asked her for. She didn't do it for praise. She didn't do it so she'd get posted on Instagram. She just did what she's supposed to do. And every time you do what you are supposed to do, your faithfulness is laying up a foundation for God to multiply and do a miracle in your life. Every time she didn't know 
that lunch that day would feed 20,000 people. And you don't know when you show up again and say, I'm here to serve at church again. And I'll hold a baby again. And I'll open a door again. You have no idea if that's going to be the day when another life is changed and a miracle breaks out. When you pray one more time, when you give obediently and faithfully in the offering, when you sow an over and above donation to advance the vision of God's kingdom, every time you're laying up a foundation, when you do the regular habitual mundane things, you are setting the stage for miracles. And Andrew says, how far will this go? I like it. I used to read that and think, man, that's how far will it go? It seems so negative. But a little while ago, God shifted how I read that text. No, no, no. What a statement of faith. Jesus, I don't have a lot, but I wonder with this massive, I just wonder, Jesus, if I give this to you, how far will it go? If I give this to you, if I'm obedient and give my life to you again, how far will this go? And he didn't know. Jesus is about to teach them some new math. You know, five plus two equals seven. In this context, five plus two equals one lunch. Jesus is about to show them that five plus two equals 20,000 lunches when it's in the hands of a savior. And, 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 and as I wrap today, I just want to show you the work. This has been my introduction. Thank you. Um, I got five quick points. Write them down. I'm going to hit you hard. Are you ready? They're coming fast. I want to show you the new math. A couple of years ago, math changed. It used to be that 21 divided by three was seven. Now 21 divided by three needs notes on a full eight and a half by 11 piece of paper to show the work. I'm like, son, this is ridiculous. And sometimes it's not enough just to be like, well, Jesus is the answer. Sometimes you gotta show the math. How do we get from where I don't have enough to more than enough? Here it is real quick. Here we go. Here's the work. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. The first step, you need to be in the right place. Miracles happen in the right place. It's green grass. It's a healthy environment. It's growing. It's nourishing. It's encouraging. Listen, can I encourage you? Coastline is the right place. This is a good house. This is a generous house. It's a generational house. It's a house of deep integrity. It's a house of tremendous character. It is healthy and it's growing. Be planted in this community. Put down roots in this community. Pull your sustenance and your strength and your value and your identity from what's happening in this community. And I know Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a lot of us spend a lot of time in places with dead grass. Here's what's true. The deeper you're planted in this good place, the quicker the grass is going to turn color in those other places. Stay planted in the right place. But then the second thing I see is it's not just the green grass. It says get in groups of 50. You got to get around the right people. It's the right place with the right people. Well, people come to us all the time. I just have such a hard time finding a spouse, friends. Like, where are you looking? Because you'll never find the right people in the wrong places. So listen, not only is Coastline the right place for you to really be planted, it's the right people to get around. And so stay, don't just show up on Sunday, get connected, meet the people, sign up to be on team, get in a small group. If the doors are open, you're here, come a little early, shake off the introvert, get into the lobby, chat with somebody while you're grabbing your coffee, get around the right people because everybody needs people who will encourage, strengthen, hold accountable. Listen, the needs you walked in with, the answer to your need might actually be in your row, but you just haven't been connected enough to know that. you got to get around the right people. It's place, it's people. And this is, so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. You need to have the right posture. The right posture, I already talked about it, but it's here. What I have is yours. It doesn't feel like it's enough, but in your hands, in your hands, and listen, it's all of you. That's the catch. Sometimes we're like, God, I've given you my marriage. And God's like, well, you haven't given me your money. So you don't really, you haven't really given me you, have you? 
You can't give him your calendar and then, and then not give him your business. You can't give him your kids, but hang on to your thought life and your web browser history. You gotta give him everything. You don't have enough to not bring everything to Jesus. You wanna step into the more, you give it all to him. It's the right place, the right people, the right posture. And then it says, then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. It's the right purpose. They serve the needs of others. Friends, we're not here for ourselves. We're here to distribute the gospel of Jesus Christ to the city and beyond. There is an anointing on Coastline Church in this season, not just for the city of Victoria, but I believe for the city of Nanaimo. I'm believing for Parksville. I'm believing for Courtney. I'm believing for Comox. I'm believing for Camel River. I'm believing for Port Hardy. And you are here to be a part of that vision. Get plugged in. Get on a team. Let's start serving people. Because it wasn't until they took from Jesus that it was multiplied. It was multiplied in the distribution. So if you feel like you don't have enough right now, you probably got to start giving and you'll watch as God starts to multiply when he sees you can be trusted. Place, people, posture, purpose. Fifth point, and I'm done, is repeat. You have to do that over and over and over and over and over again. How do I know they kept coming back to Jesus? Well, Because the Bible only ever tells us that he divided two fish. Which means when the miracle happened, he didn't lay out a buffet and then 20,000 people walked on either side of the lines and filled their plates. It means that every time the disciples came back to Jesus, he's still holding two fish and he's breaking off parts of two fish and filling another basket and they walk and they live out their purpose and they distribute to people that have need. And then once they've used that, they come back to Jesus again. They repeat and he breaks off from the two fish and the five loaves again and fills a basket and they go out and live on purpose. Listen, church and Christianity is not a Sunday thing. It's a daily thing. Monday, I got to repeat. I come back to Christ and he gives me what I need to get through my day on Monday and I live out my purpose and I come back to him again and he gives me what I need for the board meeting and the business conversation. Then I come back to him again and he gives me what I need to parent my kids and I come back to him again and he gives me what I need to speak to my neighbor about Christ. It's people, place, posture, purpose, repeat over and over and over again and it was all always just what they needed. Would you stand with me? I don't know what deficiency you carried into the room today, but here's what I do know. Every need we have is met in one place, and that's Christ. He is today your help and your healer. He is your source and your strength. He is your hope and your defense. He is your rescue and your refreshing. He is your joy and your comfort. He's all you need. He's the all-sufficient one. He is more than enough. And he has compassion on you and is already working on your behalf. It says they all ate and were satisfied. How far will this go? I believe If all were fed here, then 400,000 people in the Victoria region can be fed the gospel of Jesus Christ. That 850 plus thousand people on the island can have a saving encounter with Jesus Christ. How far will this go? I don't know. How far will it go when you bring your life? It might be new buildings. It might be new locations. It will be new cities. It might be your friends and family and co-workers getting saved. How far will this go? We won't know until we stay committed to the place, the people, the posture, the purpose. And we repeat over and over and over. If you have a need, I want you to lift your hands. Go ahead, front to the back. You say, man, there's some of believing God. Jesus, I thank you right now that you are the all-sufficient one. God, this isn't an emotional exchange. It is a supernatural encounter. Thank you that right now you're meeting needs, you're healing bodies, you're setting people free, you're breaking addiction, you're giving peace, you're providing hope. Thank you, God, that you are doing what only you can do with your eyes closed. 
I shared this in the first service, but I'm sharing it again. I believe there's a prophetic anointing on this house. The conclusion of that story was that there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers. It is leftover miracles. Coastline, Pastor Andy and Lisa, you're stepping into a season of leftover miracles. What I mean is the money you think you have to raise will be raised and more because there'll be extra miracle. That you're going to run out of time on Sundays to be sharing all the testimonies. You're going to be like, man, we forgot to talk about that healing. It's a leftover miracle. We forgot to talk about that marriage restored. It's a leftover miracle. And you're going to experience it in your life. Miracle on miracle on miracle. God, would you let it be in Victoria 